All right, it looks like our producer Trevor Ritchie is good to go. Uh, as always, guys, I am EJ Holland of the Wolverine.com, cover Michigan recruiting. That's what you guys are here for. Uh, and what we'll talk about throughout the next half hour or so. Uh, if you're not a subscriber to the Wolverine.com, please subscribe now. One dollar for one year gets you premium access to all our insider recruiting information, team information. So everything from you know the football team to the basketball team. Uh, you get to be part of our great community uh, over at the Fort message board, and you get to interact with other Michigan fans. You get all of that. For one dollar for an entire year, just go to the Wolverine.com and sign up right now. Um, appreciate you guys for joining. You can leave the leave some tips if you want. Uh, you can just press the cash button thing on my Twitter profile. Um, but anyway, guys, thanks for joining. We're going to go ahead and talk some Michigan recruiting. Hopefully, we can avoid some of the uh, Notre Dame and Sparty trolls, uh, mainly Notre Dame. Um, but let's talk about. Uh, the positive news that happened this week, Michigan earned its first commitment in the 2024 recruiting class, uh, landing Mason Curtis on 300 linebacker out of Nashville. So Mason's commitment kind of came out of nowhere. He was offered this spring. Actually, Steve Klingscale went out to Nashville, had a chance to see him during the spring evaluation period. Uh, Michigan hosted him quietly for an unofficial visit last week, right before the dead period, which started on Monday. And he was so impressed with the visit that he just felt at home and, and gave the staff a commitment. So kind of came out of nowhere, a very early commitment in the 2024 class. Um, but Michigan's done a really nice job recruiting Nashville in recent cycles, uh, obviously landing junior Colson, landing miles Pollard, now Mason Curtis, and Curtis, obviously a great prospect, uh, an, again, an on 300 kid, I believe on three has him ranked as the number 164 overall prospect in the country. Curtis right now at six foot four, 190 pounds on three has him listed at six, two. So he recently hit a growth spurt, which makes him a very intriguing prospect in the sense that he was originally recruited as more of a traditional linebacker now mainly projects as an edge just based off of measurables. I mean, he could still be a bigger linebacker. We were talking a little bit of comparisons over at the Ford, and I don't know if you remember last cycle, but Michigan was in on Lander Barton, who was uh, six, four, six foot four, 220 pounds. They liked him as more uh, of a traditional linebacker. So you could see Curtis play that role, depending on his frame, how much weight he puts, mainly how much strength he adds as well. So I think development and tracking that development over the next uh, year or two will kind of give us a better idea of where he plays. From talking to his head coach, from talking to his trainer, um, I kind of get the sense that he's a guy that just likes moving around. I don't think you necessarily have to pigeonhole him to just being a linebacker or just being an edge. I think he's a guy that can play multiple roles in Jesse Minter's defense. Uh, so he's definitely an intriguing prospect, uh, a little bit more of a dev de la <laughs> a little bit more of a uh, a guy that might need some development than you would think just based off of his ranking. But he's he is a guy that is highly ranked for a reason. He's very productive. He's a playmaker. He's comfortable covering in space. He's comfortable downhill playing the run. Um, so. Again, he he has those traits of a linebacker, but he has the measurable six foot four, one hundred and ninety pounds with the length of an edge. So a lot to like with uh, with Mason Curtis. A lot of upside there. I think he he's a very high ceiling prospect. So interested to see how he uh, kind of develops over the next couple of years. Uh, Want to take some questions from you guys, but of course we have the uh, Notre Dame trolls in here uh, requesting. We won't let them in we'll try to avoid them but any actual michigan fans can jump in and uh and make your request uh in terms of the uh 2023 recruiting cycle uh and and of course by the way we have our producer here trevor ritchie who's acting as our our bouncer for the night trying to funnel through and see which guys are actual michigan fans so he will be the one 
kind of funneling. I do know that that Haven Harris is a Michigan fan, so we'll go ahead and let him in. All right, Haven, you can talk anytime. Hey, how you doing, bud? I'm doing good. Thanks for joining. Oh, uh, I try to make all of them. Um, so I was reading some of your writing today and Marshall's writing, and you guys are, uh, as always, killing it even under what feels like a really tough seven or so days for all of us that follow recruiting so closely. Um, tell me if I'm getting kind of a general sense where you think Michigan's recruiting is at. Uh, nothing specific on any players, but this feels like given the NIL trends and just the general loss of momentum we had um, with the with Coach Harbaugh's flirtations with Minis Minneapolis, um, kind of feels like we just need to back up a little bit and let the season play out with what we all hope and think is going to be a really strong season to get that momentum going. I mean, I know there's still the barbecue at the big house here in about three weeks, four weeks, but it seems to me winning seven or eight games in a row to hopefully start the season out would be our best medicine. Is that kind of where you think we're at in terms of reestablishing momentum right now? Yeah. I mean, I think, First of all, you're going to have to have a close similar to last cycle. So, you know, I've mentioned this various times when we've had our spaces and that's, you know, last cycle, we didn't really know who Jimmy Rolder was. We, you know, didn't have any type of idea that Michigan was really in play with uh, Zeke Barry. Darius Clemens had eliminated Michigan, came back um, and, and obviously signed with Michigan. You had a flip from Amarion Walker. You you know, I had several others that were kind of late ads. Derek Moore is another one that was uh, one of the biggest ads of the entire cycle uh, who was committed elsewhere. Uh, Keon Saab was committed elsewhere. So, yeah, I think a lot can happen with a strong season. Um, I think you're completely right. The momentum from last year's strong season is out the window. There's nothing Michigan can really do to get that back that's completely gone and not only did you have jim harbaugh flirting with the nfl you had a lot of staff movement you lost both coordinators you had guys switching positions you had new additions to the coaching staff so i think just a lot changed this offseason and i think that momentum kind of went away and then you've seen especially over the last week the rise of nil just seeing what other schools are willing to do you know as jim harbaugh likes to say it's a transformational not transactional experience at michigan um that's great uh that's a great pitch to to certain recruits and certain families but it's no secret that nil is being offered uh at other places in a different way and you saw the the Jaden rashada deal although there's been you know all types of reports denying that now upwards of 10 million dollars i mean it's been kind of a cluster uh, on that end. I think Michigan needs to find a way to adapt. I'm not saying to go the route of some of these other schools or to present contracts the way Miami did, but obviously something needs to change on the NIL front for Michigan to have more success on the recruiting trail. But ultimately, I think you can still see a close similar to last cycle if Michigan has another strong season on the field, which it looks like they will. I mean, the schedule sets up nicely. The non-conference schedule is obviously not very strong. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Michigan's undefeated heading into the game against Ohio State. Um, so, yeah, I, I think another strong season could, could be the medicine, as you put it, that Michigan needs. Um, I think you could see a string of commitments here in July. I mean, Michigan's in a, a really good spot with, Paul Mubenga, an interior offensive lineman out of Georgia, who's set to commit at some point, you know, in, in the next few weeks. You have uh, Eno Etta out of Texas and on 300 edge, who's set to commit here at some point in the next few weeks. You have four-star offensive lineman Amir Herring, who has a decision date set for July 7th. And I like where Michigan sits in, in those recruitments. There are uh, a, a few others to name off as well. So I think you could see some momentum build here. In July, you obviously have the big house, uh, the barbecue at the big house in late July, and then 
the season starts and you get guys back on campus, you continue to to win, and I think things kind of correct themselves. But I think again, the the momentum and the opportunity have been lost from last year's season, and obviously Michigan needs to figure things out on the NIL front. But thanks again, Haven. We appreciate you for uh, for joining. We are going to go ahead and go ahead pick. Sorry, uh, a lot of requesters, uh, again, sorting through the trolls, but we're going to go to uh, Kuro Teron, uh, who I believe is in Spain. So we'll go ahead and welcome our international uh, requester. Well, uh, yeah. can you can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, okay. man. How's it going? How's uh, how's Europe? Everything is good. Everything is good. Finalizing my my <laughs> stage in Italy and coming back to, to Spain. First, uh, first and foremost, thank you for everything that you're doing for the Wolverine community. Uh, I know that these weeks uh, they have to be horrible for for you and and Marshall uh, with the <laughs> the news that we are having and just with everything that has been happening, as you said previously in the um, in the first uh, question. Uh, after what has happened in this week, do you feel like the Michigan staff and also um, the administration of the university are going to change their vision of NIL and not uh, focusing more on the transformational part, but more, more on the transactional? No, yeah, I mean, I think that's the, uh, the again, thanks for, for asking all the way from Spain. But yeah, I think that's kind of the million dollar question. Um, I'm not sure that I can give you a direct answer. I mean, would I like Michigan to, to change? Sure. I don't think you necessarily have to abandon your morals completely and, and turn into what, you know, maybe Miami's doing or Tennessee is doing with these eight, nine, ten million dollar deals for quarterbacks. I don't think you necessarily have to go that route. I mean, Michigan offers a lot on the field in terms of development, uh, in terms of wins. I think Michigan offers a lot off the field in terms of academics. So I still think you can find the right kids. I still think you can find very high level kids that, that fit the Michigan mold. But I do think you have to play and play NIL to an extent. I, I think that, you know, we're, we're kind of seeing recruitment suddenly change or shift. We, we saw that this week as well. So yeah, I, I do feel like, they're going to have to figure it out. I do think you have to adapt. You don't have to completely morph into something you're not. I do not expect Michigan to be a Miami or a Tennessee, but I do expect Michigan to adapt to a certain extent. Um, I, I know that NIL can be tough when it comes to recruiting because you have guys on the team that put in a ton of work and those guys deserve to be paid as well i mean how how do guys handle how are guys on miami's roster you know the current quarterback that's starting there how is he going to handle the incoming recruit already being paid 9.5 million dollars like that's got to be tough so i know jim harbaugh when he says family he means family he does want to take care of the guys on the team and i think michigan's done a really good job in terms of nil and and what nil should mean uh as far as getting guys that are athletes at Michigan taken care of, uh, not just from a football standpoint, from a basketball standpoint, from an all sports standpoint, Valiant does a really good job there as well. Um, but yeah, he wants to, to keep that team chemistry going. It is a family atmosphere at Michigan. He does mean that. And so it's tough because you want to keep that chemistry. That chemistry is what won you a big 10 title last year. So I'm all for kids getting paid at the next level. I, I do think the NCAA has to find a way to stop this from becoming the wild, wild west. I have no faith that they will do that. And so until they do that, there has to be some sort of adaptation. So I'm sure those conversations are taking place out of courses above my pay grade. But we appreciate you for joining uh, Kura all the way from Spain. We'll go ahead and head over to Owen, who is a frequent listener. Hey, Owen, you can talk now. Ah, how's it going? 
Hey, man, how are you? I'm, I'm doing pretty good. I've been doing better. Uh, but um, when, when you hear about a, a $9.5 million deal for Rashada, what does that mean? Like, is that someone giving him a check? Is that, like, where does that come from? How does he get it? What, like, what? Like, I'm, I'm totally lost on exactly what that means. Right. So, um, I don't have the exact details on the Rashada deal, so I can't speak specifically to that. I can say in terms of NIL deals and what I've heard uh, from, you know, just the recruiting world in general, basically coaches obviously can't offer NI NIL deal. And we're, we're not even talking about within the rules or outside of the rules or not, but coaches can't just say, hey, here's nine point. $5 million, obviously, you know, the hardball is not going to give you that out of his salary and neither is any other coach from around the country. So it has to come from a booster or a collective. And in California for with using Rashada as an example, NIL is legal for high school athletes. Like they can go sign an NIL deal right now in Los Angeles with random car dealership and they can get money, right? Like it, it is completely legal in the state of California. So because of that, Rashada is able to have an NIL agent or an NIL attorney um, that I, the name escapes me of the guy who brokered the deal for Rashada, but he was directly involved in getting that deal through Miami's boosters slash collectives, uh, mainly one booster there, uh, Ruiz. But, you know, if you were to look at it from an overall perspective, if, if a recruit wanted to sign uh, a similar deal with a Tennessee or with a Texas A&M or whoever, you know, they would have to go through the collective. Now, are, are those collectives communicating with the universities they are, you know, quote unquote representing? Yeah, of course, there's some type of communication there. The boosters need to know which recruits they need to talk to to offer the money. So that's kind of how it works in terms of getting in contact with the recruit, offering the recruit money. And uh, as far as how the money is paid, I mean, I'm not sure I'm not there, but I would think that there's some type of, you know, stipulations. Hey, you don't get this lump $9.5 million sum all at once. You get paid periodically like an employee gets paid weekly. You know, I don't get all my salary all at once uh, on one day of the year. I get it periodically over, you know, every or on three pays weekly so we get it every friday so i would assume it's some type of method like that that way if player x jumps in the transfer portal you just stop paying him so you know the 9.5 million dollars never completely comes out of the checkbook is the way i would imagine it's being done um but i have no clarity on that or, or obviously rashada specifically but i think it's uh it's obviously illegal it's an inducement for pay for play um but again, it's such a gray area that, you know, the NCAA isn't doing anything to govern it right now. So other schools that aren't Miami or Tennessee or Texas A&M, they're going to have to be able to figure that out. So we'll see how, how it all ends up, you know, playing out. But yeah, I mean, Michigan obviously has to adapt in some form or fashion uh, as recruits are, or recruitments are kind of changing right in front of us this summer in large part because of NIL. Thank you. And then I've, right. got, I've got a, a question on Gardner and McDonald, but I, I heard there's a lot of people. So if you want to get through them first. Yeah, we'll get to some of the others, but I appreciate you, Owen, for jumping in and asking. We'll go to Andy Schultz. He's been waiting for a little while. Hey, Andy, how's it going? What's up, my man? <clears throat> uh, just a couple quick ones. Curious about the speed back out of Tampa. Um, Carey, Anthony Carey, I saw he tweeted out some Michigan stuff recently. And then just kind of curious, your personal um, edge board for Michigan this year and thoughts on that. Yeah, edge board has the edge board has been an interesting one to uh, to follow. So we'll go ahead and, and get to that one first. Um, 
let's go ahead and and start with you know the guy we're kind of talking a lot about here uh, as nil kind of uh becomes more prevalent this summer yeah collins antium pong uh, is a guy that i love i've expressed how much i really really like him as a recruit his upside is tremendous i mean six foot eight 250 pounds uh monster kid who's only played football for one year michigan looked like it was going to be the pick on july 1st collins has been a recent listener uh on the spaces i'm not sure if he's here today uh but miami has made things very very interesting for a lot of different reasons so you know we'll see how that recruitment plays out but i mean collins would be you know, tier one uh, on my edge board for sure. I I think he's a freak. I think the obvious guy that's on the tier one of the edge board is Nicholas Harbor, even though he's more of an athlete. um, Anytime you have a a free kid who's six foot five, 235 pounds and runs a 10 to eight, which I say anytime it's, it's basically never, I mean, he's an anomaly uh, on the recruiting trail. He's the number one prospect in the country, in my opinion, I, I would rank him the number one overall guy nationally based on all my travels and everybody I've seen. Uh, I don't think you see those measurables at all ever. So, uh, I mean, just off of potential, off of what I've seen from him on the film, from my school visits, seeing him, I mean, I think Harbor is, is the guy. I think Michigan's in a really, really good spot with him terms of some of the other guys on the edge board i mean anoetta is a a really interesting guy on three has him listed as a defensive lineman because he is a bigger kid he's right at about six foot four 250 pounds right now so he's more you know a lot of people have compared him to a jabo just based on his background him being uh, uh originally from africa and uh coming over to the united states i think that you know, Eno is more like Aiden in terms of being a bigger guy that can come off the edge. But, you know, I think Eno will also see a lot of time with his hand in the dirt uh, coming off the edge that way, maybe as a five. So um, I really like him. I think he's high up on my list as well. I mean, I would say Nick won. And then, you know, I think Eno and, and Collins are kind of interchangeable. Uh, some of the other guys have, have flown off the, the board recently or are flying off the board. Tyler Thompson's a kid that we thought could end up committing to Michigan. He's now trending to North Carolina ahead of his decision tomorrow, so we'll kind of not talk about him. Jackson Howard we'll still talk about. I mean, I, it doesn't look great for Michigan right now, but they're still fighting. LSU and Miami seem like safe picks, but I love Jackson Howard. I'd, I'd probably put Jackson ahead of Collins and uh, and Eno. I think that Jackson is such a crazy versatile athlete i mean this is a kid that was rated extremely high as a tight end early on in his uh high school career and has now been rated as more of an edge guy i went out to minneapolis to see him and even though i didn't get a chance to really see him work out or anything i kind of just met with him took some pictures and all that stuff i mean just seeing his frame seeing how well put together he is both in his upper and lower halves i mean i was really impressed with with jackson howard just he passes the eyeball test. And then when you look at his film, you look at his bloodlines, his dad, I believe was a second round NFL draft pick. You look at his uh, background as just a pure athlete. This is a kid that runs track, plays baseball, plays basketball. I mean, he's a multi-sport athlete across the board. Love Jackson Howard. I mean, he would be kind of that next guy up for me. Um, And then in terms of um, other guys on the edge board, I mean, there are a few others that Michigan's looking at. I think, uh, and Merrick Kumba from France is an intriguing prospect, but I don't know enough about him to really give too much of an opinion. He's six foot seven. He's got some upside, um, but I'd like to do a little more digging on him. So that's kind of my thoughts on the guys that are currently on uh, on Michigan's edge board. Uh, not sure if I missed anybody because I went off the top of my head. And then Anthony Carey, yeah, he's a speedy back. Um, I believe he's a top 100 kid uh, out of Tampa, Carrollwood Day. Um He's one of the top targets in 2024 at the running back position. I mean, he would be a tremendous land next cycle. I'm not exactly sure where Michigan is. I know they're in the mix. Uh, You know, Mike Hart is disappointed in terms of landing higher ranked guys in his first two cycles. Um, But I do think that uh, Michigan is in play for carry. So we'll see how that one kind of progresses. But appreciate you, Andy, as always, for jumping on. 
Uh, we're going to go to Parallel Heartbreak. And then Trevor, I know you're listening. Trevor, our producer, thanks again uh, for monitoring the space. Trevor, please do some background uh, checks and uh, and let us know if any of these other new guys can join in. But Parallel Heartbreak, go ahead. What's up? Go Blue, baby. You know what time it is. Hey, man. How's it going? Thanks for joining. Hey, thank you for allowing me. Now, I, I do want to say this because and since you don't answer DMs, um, I, I will say, man, I'm, I'm one of those guys. I am a little bit disappointed in the recruiting class. I'm not going to say that I'm not. But the more I put it in perspective, and you can speak to this, I, I would rather have guys who want to be at Michigan, who want to commit to Michigan, and that might not be the highest rated than, than guys who you have to pay. Now, I'm, I'm not sure who's all getting paid. But I do, I, I'm, I'm excited that Michigan is not going to conform to that because it, you're right. It should, you shouldn't pretty much rent your child or lease your child to a university. So I think a lot of Michigan fans need to calm down. There are two players of mine I want to mention. Cole Cabana and I think his name is Amir Harry. Like, I think these guys, like mm -hmm. those guys right there, you can tell they really wanted to be in Michigan. Now, I, I know a little bit about Amir. I know you can talk more about it, but I'm glad that hopefully he picks Michigan on the seventh. And Michigan builds around players like that because you want guys who want to conform to a team, not guys like A and M who are just going to come in there and then if people aren't pulling their weight, like it's going to be some friction with this NIL. So can you talk about um, the recruiting and how the fans kind of need to take a step back and appreciate the guys that want to be in Michigan as opposed to guys who, that have to be bought? Because I mean, I don't know who these kids' parents are, like Amir and um. Um, combiners, but they raised them right. These guys don't care about the money. That degree means a lot more, and it's going to take them a lot further than this right now because that's really showing greed for a lot of these kids. So, can you speak to that if you, if you don't mind? And I'll listen. Uh, yeah, no, definitely. Some interesting points. Um, you know, talking about building programs, I mean, that's what I mean. Michigan really values family. When they say family, they mean it. Jim Harbaugh has shown that throughout his enti entire tenure at Michigan. Coming over from, even me personally in my personal experience, coming over from, you know, everybody knows I'm from Dallas, uh, coming over from the Texas beat, uh, living in Chicago, being in the Midwest, covering the University of Michigan, it's different. I mean, there's a certain feel around Michigan. There's a certain feel around the Midwest. There's, it's a lot more community driven i mean you go over to our message board and we have the best message board i think in the entire country across all recruiting networks i mean it's is is a family feel there the program has a family feel so when we talk about michigan kids when we talk about michigan recruiting there is a certain type of kid that fits what the michigan program is or what michigan is in general or even just the midwest in general there's kids that have great personalities that usually have great families that are also high academic kids, but not, <laughs> not kids like Notre Dame, like more kids that really care about academics and aspire to be something, but aren't robots kids that, you know, have magnetic personalities, kids that, um, you can, again, build programs around. So when you talk about Amir Herring specifically, even though he's not a Michigan commit right now, I mean, Amir is a kid that I've known for since since I got here, basically. Uh, so four years or three and a half years, whatever, however long it's been. Um, but Amir is a, one of my favorite kids, and, and his parents are great um, as well. But Amir is one of my favorite kids because he fits that mold exactly. I mean, this is a kid that wants to be a medical doctor. Um, when, when he, when his playing days are finished, uh, but he's also a kid that just has that personality. Everybody loves Amir, man. Like any kid you talk to in the state of Michigan, any coach you talk to in the state of, of Michigan, if you bring up Amir Herring, I guarantee you not one person will have anything bad to say about Amir Herring. So I love Amir. I love what he brings to the table as just a character kid and, and I love his parents as well. His family has been nothing but great to me since I moved here and getting to know him just as an underclassman coming up from, um, from covering Donovan to covering Amir now as a senior has been really, a really cool experience. Um, you know, Cabana, I don't, I don't know Cole as well as I do Amir, but just my interactions with him have, have been great. You know, he's been completely solid throughout the recruiting process as well. So yeah, those are, program building kids i think you definitely need to 
appreciate kids like like those guys. I mean, one guy you didn't mention is Samaj Morgan. I mean, that's a kid that has spent the last couple of weekends, you know, taking time out of his weekend to go help Michigan recruit. Uh, he was on campus this past weekend with five-star wide receiver Jalen Ra- Jalen Brown. So he wants to build the class. He wants, you know, he's been actively working hard on Amir as well. Uh, and Samaj Morgan, I think, you know, just just hearing his his funny little accent, like he just has like that Detroit accent. I mean, he represents what Detroit is. He's tough. He's gritty. When you say dog, it's an overused term. But when you're talking about Samaj Morgan, that's him. He's a dog. And I, I really love what Samaj brings to the table as well. And all those kids are, are very good uh, players on the field as well. I mean, Samaj is, is an explosive slot. I mean, Amir, the kindest kid off the field, but he he really gets down and dirty in the trenches on the field. Cabana, 10-6 speed. I mean, that's very hard to teach, so you can use them in a lot of different ways. So those are the building blocks for your program. At the same time, I don't think you can be naive in terms of kids that are top 100 kids. I mean, you need to land elite players as well. I mean, you don't need to land all elite players. You need your program builders. Um, But I think you need to land top 100 kids. And in order to land top 100 kids, um, you do have to do NIL to an extent. So I think that's obviously for Michigan to figure out. Um, I do think there are uh, some exceptions that that Michigan can get. Um, I don't, again, I said this at the beginning, I don't think you need to be Miami. Don't think you need to be Tennessee. I don't think you need to be Texas A&M, but at the same time, times are changing. And whenever times change, the people that do the best are the people that adapt the quickest. And so I think Michigan needs to adapt um, and have difficult conversations. It's hard. Nobody's going to be an expert on NIL. Nobody's going to know exactly how to, to find the right balance. But I think uh, Michigan it's leaders in best. So I think it's, it's for them to kind of figure out exactly the best approach while keeping those morals and keeping those standards of what being a Michigan student athlete means. So hopefully that long winded answer, you know, kind of, uh, touches on your statement and your question. Um, all right, Trevor, we got some new guys requesting. Have you done any background checks? You want to let anybody in? First of all, I thought it was hilarious that Parallel Heartbreak hops in and goes, since you don't answer DMs. <laughs> I saw great. some people laugh at that. I mean, I get a ton of DMs because my DMs are open. So not only do I have random recruits sending me film, but I also have Notre Dame trolls in there every day <laughs> sending me stuff. So I don't even check that folder anymore. I think also, EJ, to address uh, the other Owens question from earlier about the Miami deal. I'm pretty sure that's a promise to fund that amount in deals over time, right? Like you said, essentially paid out over time, but you couldn't just do it that way. A a deal or a sense of action, so to speak, to prove that they're doing something for the money has to come with that. But I believe that's all that is, is as a boost or a promise to an athlete to get you this amount in NIL deals. I may be wrong there as well, but to address the uh, requesters, EJ, I think N. Watts, Ike, Owen, Dave, and Xander are all good to go, so that's up to you. All right, we'll go quickly through these guys. I might not give as long answers since we're already over half an hour, but we'll get to every one of you guys if you guys want to stay in the uh, the request line. So we'll go Xander. We'll go order that it's giving me. We'll go Xander Woods first. All right, Xander, you are live. You can uh, speak if you just unmute yourself. Oh, my fault. I was I totally was not paying attention. I didn't think I would get called up. <laughs> <laughs> All good. What's up, man? Hey, well, before I ask my question, I just want to let you know, EJ, big fan of yours. Subscribe to the Wolverine. I love what you do for uh, our university. So I want to just say thank you to you. Um, <clears throat> no, I appreciate that. And um, my question is, How do you feel so far on the possibility of landing, you know, John T. Cook and Jalen Brown? And it's almost a two-part question. The second question is, do you feel that Michigan, with the NIL, do you think they're making positive strides for that adaptation to NIL and getting more top 100 recruits? Definitely. So, yeah, you know, in terms of adapting, I think, 
everything's changed so quickly that Michigan has made positive strides, but in terms of legal NIL or team NIL, uh, yeah, they've, they've done a great job. I think JJ McCarthy, you know, I don't think an exact number is out there, but I would probably bet a pretty decent sum that he's over, um, that he's at seven figures. So I I think JJ's doing well with NIL. I think a lot of guys are, you know, Donovan's had some opportunities. Juniors had some opportunities, um zach zinter i know the the valiant group has done well getting everybody at least a share of uh of profits off of nil so i think michigan has done nil the right way arguably the best in the country but nobody really cares about that because they care about recruiting um and so that's a tough line to walk like i said there's a difference in the way a lot of schools are doing it i don't think michigan will become miami or i've said that on repeat today um but i do think that there's going to be some discussions and how to adapt while keeping those standards and and morals and because i went on that uh tangent train of thought xander can you repeat your other question to me i'm sorry i completely forgot um the other part of the question was how confident or i shouldn't say confident but how do you feel about michigan's odds of possibly landing you know a john Tay cook or a jalen brown yeah no great um with jalen brown i thought the visit went really well i think he's a kid that you go man he's taking it deep into the fall um you know he might not even sign or make an announcement until december he still wants to use his other three official visits and that's a kid that Michigan's been involved with for a long time. This was his third trip to campus. I talked to his father, James, had a great interview uh, with the elder Brown. If you want to go check that out on the Wolverine for everybody that's not subscribed, that's $1 one year. Uh, but James gave some really, really great answers. I think Michigan can stay in it until the very end. Uh, with Cook, I would say the safe bet is Texas. Not too optimistic there. I thought they did a great job on the visit, but um, I think that one's going to be tough. Um, but it, with both guys, I mean, I'm interested to see how NIL affects them. I mean, both of them are top 40 recruits nationally. Um, I think Jalen Brown's the number one wide receiver in the country. So, again, we'll see if Michigan can adapt on the NIL front. But appreciate you, Xander, um, for, for joining in. We'll go to uh, to Dave Litz. All right. Thank you. Oh, I'll be sure to tell Amir the nice words. All right. Thanks, Xander. All right, Dave, you're on. All right, um, I have a, a two-parter. One, uh, what do you think Michigan's chances are with uh, JV and Toviano, who was just in town this past weekend? And two, I'm seeing the last few weeks, there are a bunch of kids who are dropping their top five, six, seven, and including Michigan in it, but you don't seem to see a ton about them. Uh, I'm just wondering how many of those are kind of a hat on the table, like a Shelton, Sam- uh, Shelton Sampson, uh, Will Norman, uh, Jaden Robinson so on and so forth or how many of them it's legit interest Malik Muhammad yeah no good question so yeah in terms of uh how many of them are getting I I guess using Michigan as a hat is a good way to put it um yeah I think a decent amount of those are I mean Malik Muhammad I don't see him ending up at Michigan I don't uh see Will Norman ending up at Michigan so a lot of guys we're not really writing about or retweeting their top schools or whatever it's because it's likely not going to be Michigan. Um, in terms of JV and Tobiano, I do feel like Michigan made a, a good move this weekend. Clink scale has been working really, really hard on that recruitment. He went out to Dallas and had a chance to see him uh, during the this, this spring evaluation period. He's built a great relationship there. I think the safe bets are probably the in-state schools, but he does have kind of a wandering eye. He's not only interested in Michigan, he's interested in in Oregon, I, I know he he wants to, to go back out there. So, um, yeah, there's a, a decent chance, I think, with Toviano, but not super, super optimistic right now. I think the one kid you mentioned in your top schools uh, group question uh, that I didn't touch on that's actually a legit target is uh, Jaden Robinson. There are some linebackers at Michigan really likes in this class. Uh, Samaj Bridgman, obviously, they want to keep Raylan Wilson. Um, they like Phil Picciotti a lot, who came in for an official visit. Uh, Arvel Reese, who came in for an unofficial visit, is another uh, top-of-the-board guy. Jay Nosberry, another one. So I, I just think there are some guys ahead of him. Uh, but depending on how those recruitments play out, and I think some of those are going to be hard pools 
um, you know, like an Arvel Reese who, who's been in Ohio State lane um, or Picciotti, who I think probably ends up at Oklahoma. Um, you know, you could see Jaden rise up the board. They're looking to bring him in for uh, a fall official visit. So he's definitely one to keep an eye on. I don't think he's just a hat on the table guy, but it depends on others. Um, we'll go ahead and go to another Owen. We'll go to Owen Brown. Uh, All right, Owen. Hello. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? Good, thanks for joining. Um, so I just wanted to um, say I really enjoyed uh, riding that Dante Moore um, roller coaster of a recruitment. And um, with him looking like he's going to Oregon, how does – uh, the Michigan staff expect to land targets like Jaden Davis and uh, Nick Harbor when NIL and um, recruiting is just such a big factor right now. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we've talked a lot about NIL today. Um, you know, in, in terms of those kids in particular, I think when you look at Nick Harbor, I mean, he has such a great background. I believe his mother is a pharmacist. She works in a hospital and his father works for NASA. Um, So when we talk about academic kids, I mean, it doesn't get any better than Nick Harbor. I mean, he's a 4.0 kid, uh, great family, has family throughout the state of Michigan. So I think he's unique in the sense that, yeah, Nick Harbor might command more NIL money than anybody just because he's so marketable. I mean, it's not every day you see a six foot five, 235 pound, 10 to eight Olympian slash NFL type of athlete that also has a 4.0. I mean, it's crazy. I think he can make so much of NIL. I I think his ceiling is unlimited. And I think a, a plus there is that Nick knows that, like he has to know that. Right. Uh, so I think he's not a guy that's just going to take, $10 $10 million right off the bat because he knows that his earning potential is crazy. On top of that, he comes from a great family. So yeah, I don't think Nick, I think Nick is a unique case where I'm a little wary of NIL just because we've been burned with NIL recruitments here recently, but I'm not as concerned knowing his background and knowing what his earning potential could be, uh, especially at a place like Michigan that offers a global brand and especially a kid like him that wants to be Olympian and uh, an Olympian as well as an NFL player and wants to have a global brand. So I, I'm not as concerned with Nick, but we'll see. I mean, his recruitment is going to be a long one, possibly going into December. And then with Jaden Davis, I know Jaden, I, I don't know Jaden too well, uh, obviously not as well as I know Dante. Um, but from my initial conversation, meeting him the, for the first time in Vegas this summer, um, he was he was so great. His answers were awesome. I mean, this is a kid that really, really values NFL development. And when you look at Matt Weiss, yeah, he's not a personable recruiter. I mean, he's not a great recruiter in general, but what he does offer is an extremely high football IQ. I mean, everybody on the roster right now, JJ Cade, they have all raved about his football acumen, uh, his film breakdowns. And then you look at his analytics too, and that's another plus. And just the fact that he worked, with the Baltimore Ravens and, and had uh, at least a little bit of a hand with Lamar Jackson, I think is very appealing to Jaden. And then Jim himself, obviously playing quarterback in the NFL, having coached quarterbacks like Andrew Luck and Colin Kaepernick, that kind of sells itself as well. So I think Jaden really values that. I'm not sure how much NIL will factor with Jaden, but I know that the uh, NFL ties are a big reason that Michigan has some early momentum there, but in terms of guys not named Jaden Davis or Nick Harbor, I think, again, you know, Michigan's going to have to have those hard discussions about adapting uh, as we head into kind of a, a roller coaster of college football recruiting. But we appreciate you for joining. We will go ahead and go to our last two requesters. We'll go to Ike Hamlin. Yo, can you all hear me? Yep, what's up, Ike? Oh, hey, AJ. Uh, AJ, just thanks for doing this. This is awesome. And also want to say, people who troll, like Notre Dame folks, they like, actually get in spaces like this and troll, that's unbelievably unbelievably weird. Like, that's, that's something I've never heard of. But anyway, um, so AJ, my question is, do you think, like, this recruiting class might be a little 
like a, a little more light just because of the depth we have at a lot of positions. Like if you look at the wide number of wide receivers we have, we have a bunch of wide receivers. All can play. All can, all are pretty good. And we have outside of the starter, starting quarterback, we have like Alex Orgy, Davis Warren, Jaden Denegal, I think his name is, and whoever else is left on the bench. Like that just seems like it seems like there's so many people waiting in line that maybe you don't need to take that many people at certain positions. I don't know. Just just curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I think uh, numbers are so hard. I mean, I think every year you you pretty much end up close to 25 or around there. Um, so I'm not sure if the overall number will change. I, I'm still expecting, you know, about 24 or so. We'll see if that number does change. Um, I think it's less at certain positions, right? So you already landed your tight end. They talked about taking two this class, but they've landed two the last couple of cycles. And last year's haul was really good with Colson Loveland and Marlon Klein. So I don't think you need another tight end. I think the linebacker is going to be kind of a small class. Um, you know, they're hoping to keep Raylan. I think they add one more, maybe two more, but uh, you could see a, a two man linebacker class. Uh, they had a special defensive back haul last cycle. So you're looking at about, you know, four there, maybe even three if it really gets down to it. But I think they'd like, uh, you know, one safety, one nickel, two corners would probably be ideal in the secondary. Quarterback's going to be one, uh, you know, if any now, if if Dante doesn't land, which is looking unlikely. Um, receiver you mentioned as one that has depth. Yeah, they're only looking at three with Samaj being a slot, and they want a guy. They want two outsides, one being a bigger guy and one being a, a speedier guy. So, um, yeah, I think that um, I think receiver is going to be small as well. But I think you have groups that are going to be pretty big as Michigan has transitioned on the defensive side of the ball in terms of scheme. I think you still want to add some more true defensive linemen. So I think you want another nose. I think you want another three tech. I think you want a, another guy that can play nose or three. So, yeah, it's, I still think you could add uh, quite a few more just to the defensive line. And that's not even including edge guys with Aiden and Ajabo off to the league. And, uh, again, the switch in defensive scheme and, and Mike Elston coming in and making his own evaluations, I think, you're going to see, you know, three, four edge guys uh, being taken this cycle. And then offensive line, you only had two high school offensive linemen taken last cycle. So I think this is going to be a, a bigger group, even though targets have dwindled. Um, I, th I think you could still see four or five guys um, along the offensive line for sure. So, yeah, I think position wise, it's just uh, it's it just varies. But um, that's kind of the, the biggest breakdown I can give. Um, so we appreciate you for, for joining Ike. We're going to our last requester and Watts and we'll close out the show with his, I know he's been waiting for a while. So, uh, so sorry. Uh, and Watts, but you are good to go. You get the, the, uh, the last question. in. so I guess that's a, that's a plus. All right, man, you just have to, to unmute your speaker and then we can get you in. Perfect. You hear me? Okay. Cool. Yeah, we got you. Perfect. Yeah, EJ, I just want to thank you first off for your time this this afternoon and uh, go blue. But I uh, got a comment on one question, so to kind of parallel off of what Parallel said. So I feel like Michigan isn't really a place for someone who wants to cash just one check. It's cash and checks for the rest of your life. So if you're here for NIL, then that's great. But like Harbaugh says, it's transformational, not transactional. So I'm all on board for that. Um, my question, though, is kind of going off of all these visits and all these officials in June, uh, it seems like we haven't got as many commitments as we normally do. So is that more of a, hey, we've got more silent commitments, or is that something to where we need to be a little concerned about? Yeah, I mean, it's tough. Michigan doesn't really land a ton of early commits, uh, at least since I've been on the beat. A lot of commits come in July um, and, and throughout June, I think it's a little concerning that there's only one commitment coming out of June with, with it being Deacon Tonielli. Um, I think July will be a good month for Michigan. I think you'll see at least a few more. Um, and then you're going to have to have a strong close la like last cycle. And in terms of my concern level, uh, it's still pretty medium. Um, it, it's, 
rising a little bit just because some recruitments are changing with the NIL factor. And that's going to be just really tough for me as a reporter personally to follow the sudden shifts in recruitments based on what NIL deals are being offered across the board. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I would say I have pretty mild concern on a one to 10, like hot wing rating. I would say it's like a 6.5 concern, but the good thing that we talked about earlier in the space is Michigan schedule shapes up nicely. I mean, this, unless something happens this season, I, I see it being another really, really strong season on the field for Michigan. There's bound to be, coaching changes and movements that Michigan can capitalize on. And that's not a great long-term recruiting strategy, but I think for this cycle, while they figure out NIL, it's going to have to be very similar to last cycle where you identify guys that are going to be big rankings jumpers, like a Jimmy Rolder. You get back in the mix with guys and never lose contact with, with high level prospects and you could have a Darius Clemens, you know, you capitalize off of coaching movement, like a Derek Moore, like a Keon Saab. So I still think Michigan is more than capable of doing that. Another thing that puts me at ease is, yeah, they're not really closing on guys right now. And that sucks, but you know, these guys didn't just become bad recruiters overnight. Like you still have a lot of strong recruiters on staff. You know, Bellamy is still a great recruiter. Clink has always been a great recruiter. Elston dating back to his time at Notre Dame has always been a great recruiter. Jesse Minter, although at a lower level, was a G5 recruiter of the year. Um, George Hilo has great connections in Florida and is a very good recruiter himself. Um, so, I mean, Sharon Moore is a great recruiter still, even though he hasn't you know, produced a lot of offensive line uh, guys here this class or last class. He was once the best recruiter on Michigan staff, you could argue. Uh, he has a lot more on-the-field responsibilities, which I think contributes to him maybe not landing as many guys, but he's still capable of of helping Michigan, you know, close late. I think Grant Newsom's a rising star as a tight end recruiter. He's got his guy locked in, so I think he can help at other positions, mainly offensive line. So, yeah, I'm still confident that the guys on this staff can get it done um, late as we head into fall. Look, I mean, there's no sense uh, about crying uh, about recruiting right now and losing the momentum from the Big Ten championship. It's gone. It's over with. Uh, it's about Michigan taking the next step and finding the guys, and, and we'll see how it all plays out. But I do envision it being close or around the same type of finish as last fall, as long as Michigan produces on the field. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's going to be tough to follow over the next couple of months. Again, July should have a few commitments, um, but we'll just have to see how this NIL stuff plays out, and we'll have to see if Michigan can duplicate its success from last year, um, and that'll kind of drive how this recruiting class finishes. But as always, guys, appreciate you. I know we had a couple of uh, – Last requesters. Actually, let's just let's just do this last requester. It looks like Eric Reed has joined in late. Let's let's give him the honor of doing the uh, last question, and then we'll get out of here. We've already gone well over the thirty minutes anyway, so we'll wait for Eric to request, and then we'll get out of here. Um, Eric is connecting. I'm not sure um, if it's his connection or, or my connection. And a shout out to Collins joined late. Collins, uh, hopefully uh, everything's going well with your recruitment here late. I know it's stressful um, with with things down the stretch, um, but good luck as your decision comes up. Yeah, man, shout out to you. Um, not sure what's going on with uh, with Eric, but he has left, so we'll give Jonathan Crutcher the last question. All right, looks like Jonathan's having trouble connecting too. No, he's on. Let's shout out to Jonathan. What's up, Jonathan? Well, Jonathan has gone away. Um, as always, guys, thanks for joining the space. Uh, you can sign up for the Wolverine.com right now, one dollar, one year, and get all the latest Michigan recruiting information. Hope you guys have a great rest of the week.